Every so often, ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity, everybody does, to be offended. Um, Jesus said that it's impossible, but that it will come. All right, so we're, we take him at his word, then we have to understand that um, we're going to face that. As, there's no way around that. It's going to happen. Some years ago, the Lord dealt with my heart as a pastor, and I spent a lot of time and effort and energy since him dealing with me about people that hold on to grudges and bitterness and unforgiveness, things of that nature. And this is part of my learning process when I was dealt with by the Lord along those lines. And as a pastor, I want to tell you one of the greatest problems in the body of Christ I know of no case here in our church in particular, but in the body at large, a pastor that had spent over 50 years in the pastoral ministry had made the statement, he said, the greatest problem in the church world today is unforgiveness in the ranks. And I believe that. I really do. And one of the, one of the things that we have to e embrace as believers is the fact that um, just because we're saved doesn't mean that we're immune uh, from situations happening to us that can, can cause us uh, to be offended. I mean, we're not immune from that. Uh, the Lord said in one place, he said, it rains on the just and on the unjust. And so when I realize that, I understand that while rain in certain instances may be a blessing, in certain other instances it's, it's not a blessing. Amen? And so it is the same way with life. Uh, this corrupt state of the human heart, if you will, in spite of the influences of the Holy Ghost and the grace of God, men will continue to sin against God and against their fellow man because we're human. We all make mistakes. Would somebody say amen to that? Uh, it is impossible, but that offenses will come and as they did in the days of Jesus, so they come mainly in our generation by Pharisees. And that is men and women who trust in themselves to be more righteous than the others that they're dealing with is. Uh, after the message this morning, I was talking to a friend of mine up in northwest Arkansas, and he was telling me about a preacher friend that me and him both know, and he made the statement to me. He said years ago, he made the statement to someone that he was smarter than anybody on the state board. And uh, I thought about that since he told me that, and I, I, I you know, I, I, pity, I pity that because uh, the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. Uh, the more I realize that what I thought I knew when I was a young man really wasn't all what I thought it was. And the Bible said it's a fool that never changes his mind. All right? And so we know that what that is, uh, that what that is talking about. Uh, so when we realize that these things are going to happen to us, we want to we we look at what he's telling us here in the Scripture so that we'll know how to recognize it when it comes our way so that we can understand how to deal with it, because it will come. Amen? Yeah, sometimes, most of the time, it's going to be from people that we have a lot of confidence in, uh, people that we love, people that we respect and hold in high esteem. And uh, I want to ask you tonight, to sh show of hands, for those of you that know of opportunities and times in your life that you offended somebody and didn't even know you did for quite some time. I know I have. Okay, and so we want to talk a little bit about that. Now, I want us to look at the word impossible there. In the Greek, it's a word that means something that is impossible or inadmissible, unallowable or unthinkable. So it's something that is unthinkable. Uh, one scholar said that you could translate this verse of Scripture this way. Quote, it is simply unthinkable that you would allow yourself to dream that you could live this life without an opportunity to become offended. I really do believe that's a good interpretation of that. 
uh, because that's what Jesus said, and yet I've been caught up myself in the mindset that I am somehow not going to get there. I have actually had the idea in my mind before that I thought, well, I'm more mature than that, or I am uh, more grounded in the Word than that. And so none of that, none of that uh, is an excuse that we can find in the Bible, is it? I may be mature. I may be older in the faith. I may be wiser in the faith. I may have been doing this a long time. But the moment that I think that it's impossible that I can be offended is the moment that I prepare myself for the enemy and his wrecking ball. Amen? Because that's what's going to happen to me. I want us to look at the word offense tonight. Amen? He said that it comes from a word that we get our word scandal from. And everybody knows what a scandal is. We talk about that's a scandalous person. They've been involved in more scandals than Carter got liver pills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we understand what a scandal is. It is a powerful picture, though, when we understand it in light of what we're looking at in the Scripture, uh, that, that it's a picture that we must understand. Now, it, the word is, was originally used to describe uh, the trap piece in a trap, a, like a coon trap or something. It's a little piece of wood or in a steel trap, it's a little piece of steel. A rat trap, that little, that little piece of barb that you stick up under the edge of that when that, that unsuspecting person or critter goes in there and messes with that, the door slams shut and they're caught. And so this is, a, this is what it's talking about. I seen an episode the other day of Andy Griffith and Barney had gotten lost and he was trying to show Gober or Gomer how to get back to where the boys were camped at. And, you know, anybody ever remember that episode? And they got caught out there and they got hungry and Barney had been trying to show them how to start a fire and Barney couldn't start a fire. And he'd been showing uh, Gomer how to catch a bird in a snare and Barney couldn't build a snare, and so uh, oh Andy, he'd got some groceries from the from the campsite and brought them with him because he'd been out there all day wandering around, and so he got a chicken and he brought that chicken in there and he brought matches and built a little old fire there and built a, a spit so he could fix that chicken where it looked like old Goober had been uh, Gomer had been rotisserying the chicken for a for a while, and when Barney comes back, he's all excited uh, uh, about what it was but in the snare there was a stick with a string attached to it that they were to jerk out from under there so that when the bird or the pheasant or whatever got in there they could catch him and this is the same type of a thing that uh, the writer here in in the original Greek is talking to us about it. It's something the New Testament also calls, uh, uses the word scandal and to refer to those, a stone or an obstacle, if you would, that causes somebody to trip or to stumble or to lose footing or to waver, to falter or to fall down. In Second Peter, if, in First Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse number 8, that's the same word that was used to describe somebody that hurt heard the gospel and refused to believe the gospel and he said this this is what he said he said it is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word and what Peter is saying he said there are those that have heard the word there are those that understand it, but they refuse to receive it. They refuse, you refuse to accept it and embrace it. And that same word that was meant to be their salvation and their deliverance has now become a stumbling block for them. It's pretty powerful, is it not? In the hour that we're living in right now, we all know individuals, it's exactly like that. Rather than accept the message and be saved, these people stumble when they hear the truth, tripping over the very message that could deliver their souls and set them free. And I'm, I'm doing more teaching tonight than I'm doing anything, but I want, us to, I want us to get this in our heart. I want us to get this in our spirit because, you know, we live in trouble sometimes. 
and, and they're not going away anytime soon. And so we must prepare ourselves. How many of you know to, to foreknow is to be for, uh, uh, beforehand prepared? It is to be forewarned is to be prepared. Amen? And so when God gives us something like this and we want to look at it and we want to say, okay, Lord, I, I want to make sure that I recognize no matter how many years I've been living for you, no matter how deep I am spiritual, no matter how many times you've used me in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, I want to make sure that I don't fall or trip it's something that is meant and something that is designed to show me how to live a victorious life above the things that I'm faced with in my life. I don't want to stumble at it, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to, I don't want to stagger through this life. Amen? I, I, I do want to be a person of purpose. I want to be a man of purpose, a man that is driven by purpose, a man that walks according to the purpose of God in his life. This is what my desire is. Amen. In our text tonight, Jesus used the word to warn us about events that could happen in life with the potential to trip us up. And so the devil come comes along and he'll bait us with something drawing us into the trap that he knows very well that we're going to be offended with. Now one of the things I learned a long time ago was this, and that is what offends me would not even raise an eyebrow on you. And vice versa. Have you ever had somebody come to you and talk to you about their problems and why you're standing there listening to them? I mean in your own life and in your own situation, your own family, you're standing neck deep in alligators and you're thinking, oh Lord, I'd swap places with you in a heartbeat because to you, you just don't understand why they're, what all the fuss is about. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, but the reality of it is it's a big thing to them while yours is a big thing to you. There may be somebody that you know that you talk to and that you confided in Amen. And you might think, well, I'm about to come apart at the seams. And they may be looking at you like, I would swap places with you in a heartbeat because I've got this, 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 and this going on. And we've all been guilty of that. One guy, you know, was talking about the study, if you will, on the uh, picking up your cross daily and following Jesus. And uh, he said that he was complaining because his, his cross was so heavy. And uh, he had a dream one night, and in that dream, there was this huge room. And in this room, there was crosses of all size, great, big, huge crosses that seemed like went up into the heavens. And there were some just stacked all around the wall and standing up next to walls. And he said there was little bitty crosses, and there was little tiny crosses, and there was middle-sized crosses. And there was all kinds of crosses in this room. And so he went up to the man in, in the room, and he said to them, he said, I want to... I want to exchange my cross. My cross is so heavy. I want to exchange my cross. And so the man told him, he said, well, you can go and choose you another cross and you can take that cross with you and you can bear that cross. And he went over to this place in this room and it was a little small cross there up beside the wall and he reached to pick that one up. And he said, I believe I'll take this one here. And the man said, well, that's the one you brought in with you. Uh, so we understand that cross-bearing is relative, isn't it? It was about to crush him, but when he compared it in a room full of other size crosses, he realized that he had the least burden to bear of anybody whose crosses were represented in that room. And that's the way it is in my life a lot of times. Have you ever been guilty of looking around and thinking, man, I wish I had that situation or I wish I had that circumstance in my life? When I was a young preacher, I used to think, man, I wish I could pastor a church like that guy's pastoring. And, but I learned, Brother Ed, over time that I couldn't handle it if I'd have had the church. You understand what I'm saying? Because God takes us through a process to get us ready for whatever it is he has in our future. So whatever it is that's going on in your life right now, whatever the circumstance is that's causing you pain or tears, get ready because God's got something bigger in store for you down the road. You're going to be a more effective witness down the road than what you are right now, but the cross may seem heavy right now. 
Amen. You may be fighting off devils and demons trying to stay and keep yourself from being offended when all the time God is getting ready to put something on you that only you're going to be able to take care of in the circle of friends and family and churchmen that you are associated with. Isn't that awesome? Because he knows where we are, he knows where we need to be, and he knows how to get us there. Are y'all with me? And so what we're looking at here is we want to understand that I've got to do it and I've got to be able, if you will, not to become uh, 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 offended with everything that comes my way. It seems like everybody and their brother is offended nowadays. I said something to you here a while back and I want to repeat it tonight. I said it seemed like everybody in the church, and I say everybody, you know that's a, that's a relative term that it seemed like the church wants to confess her rights instead of her sins nowadays. And the reason for that is we've got caught up into the spirit of the age where that it's got to be somebody else's fault that something's happened to me that's made me not to feel very comfortable in my life. And the reality of it is that this life just happens and life is not fair to any of us. Would you say a good amen to that? And I, I wish it were, but it's just not. And so time, sometimes a devil will bait us with something that draws us into the snare, and he knows when he gets us there that if we're not careful, we're going to have a moment where we bump into the offense and the trap slams shut, and like an animal that's trapped in a cage, we can't get out, and we fu suddenly find ourselves caught in a miserable situation that's detrimental and brings about negative emotions in our hearts and lives. And so the devil has done his job. Would you say a good amen to that? And so here we are today. We want to look at this and we want to, I want to I talk just a minute about the devil's bait because he always uses what he knows will get us, doesn't he? He knows what buttons to push in your life. Somebody said, one guy stood one time, and, and I was behind him at KFC, and we'd gone into there after a youth rally one night, and he was standing at the corner, at the, at the counter of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and he said, I heard him tell somebody, his wife standing next to him, said, well, I'm not perfect, but what I like ain't very much. And I thought when he said that, Brother Ed, I wish I could talk to his wife by herself and find out what the real story is. Amen? Yeah. You see, we, we think we're all of that in a box of Cracker Jacks too, but the reality of it is we're really not as much as we think we are. The Bible said that if we would humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he would exalt us in due season. We don't have to worry about that. We just have to get ourselves and prepare ourselves for that. And part of that is learning how to deal with people that come in and out of your life that baits your life with traps to cause you, they don't even realize they're being used by the enemy. Now, some time ago, many years ago now, I wasn't very long into the church, and I hadn't started pastoring. I hadn't started full-time ministry at all, but I was working at the tissue mill still, and I had a friend of mine who was a Baptist man, and he and I had been working together, and I didn't know about it for over a year. And somebody told me about it, that while he and I were working together, that I offended him some way or another. I didn't know what I said, didn't know what I'd done. But I knew what I had to do. I knew that when I saw him again, I had to approach him and I had to talk to him and I had to try to make things right. And so we hadn't worked together in a long time. And on that particular day, he was coming in as I was going out. And on the way in and I was on the way out, I stopped him and I said to him that it's come to my attention that over a year ago when you and I were working together, that I'd done something or I said something that hurt your feelings. I said, I do not know what it was. I do not know what we were talking about. I said, but I stopped you for one reason and one reason only. I want to ask you if you will forgive me for whatever it is that I did or whatever I said. And he knew that I was sincere about it. And he looked at me and a smile came on his face. And he said to me, Kenneth, it's a done deal. And we shook hands and we walked on. But I remember how I felt as I walked away from him. I felt like in the faith that I had grown six foot tall in the things of God. Amen. Simply because I'd done what I knew I should do in order to keep a fence from between me and a fellow brother in the Lord. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
You say, Pastor, you believe that we really have to live our lives that way? Let me just say, that's what the Word teaches, and that's how I have to live. All right? Now, some people get offended whenever you preach the gospel. Okay, and, and I'm not talking about having to run around as a minister of the gospel and apologize for teaching people what the Word of God said. I, I, don't, get, I don't do that, but I'm going to tell you, if I, if I teach you the gospel or I preach to you the gospel and I do it in the wrong spirit, I'm as wrong as if I was telling you something that was un, total untrue. Okay, because the word said that I, as a shepherd of the sheep, am not to lord it over the sheep. I am to be an example to the sheep. Somebody say amen. And so if I'm not careful, I don't want to hurt one of the little ones that Jesus talked about. Uh, but see, what I, what I want us to do is understand that these little ones can be easily... Who's he talking about anyway when he says little ones? I, I don't believe that he's just talking about children. I believe he could have been talking about children, I, but I don't believe he's just talking about kids. I believe he's talking about little ones in the faith. Those that hadn't been saved very long. You see what I'm saying? You have to be careful not to offend one of those that's just getting started. Now, many years ago when Sister Pack and I was meeting the board, I was, all, I was pastoring my first church and I'd done gone through exhorters and I'd gone through license and I was meeting the board to be ordained. I'd done all the training, all the education, and I went to meet the board. We were the last ones. We'd drive from the other side of the state. We were the last ones there and they kept us the last. We come in. My wife had my daughter. She was just a little bitty girl and she held her in her lap and they began to talk to us and process us through the process and began to talk to me. And when all of a sudden one of the guys on the board he made this statement to me. He said, Brother Pack, do you believe that it's wrong uh, for you to poke holes in the temple of the Holy Ghost? And I knew when he said that that he had spotted my daughter's uh, golden ear studs in her ears as a little girl. And I felt myself getting angry. You hear what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, I'm sanctified, but I'm human. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And as, as he said that to me, I knew what he was saying, what he was getting to. And the district super, superintendent did too. And I just looked at him and I said, well, sir, I wouldn't poke holes in mine. And that's the way I said. I was angry. And so the superintendent told us we could go out. And he said, Brother Pack, when you come back in, leave your wife and daughter outside. So I left him in the foyer of the, in the office and I went back in and, and sat down and met the board and I was still seething and I was still angry. And the superintendent brought this up to me again and he said to me, and see, one of the reasons I was angry is because some of the ones that were sitting on that board, they were guilty of things a whole lot worse and I knew this. You see what I'm saying? I'm talking about being stumbled. I'm talking about tripped up. I'm talking about being offended. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Compared to those men, they had many, 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 many years of ministry. I've been pastoring less than a year. I've been in the ministry for just a few years, and I have stumbled big time at, at a Pharisee, just for lack of better terminology. And so I... Superintendent looked at me and he said, Brother Pike, I've got a lot of confidence in you. And he said, I'm going to ask you a question. I said, okay. He said, uh, do you have any problem with taking those ear studs out of your daughter's ears? And I said, brother, have I ever failed to comply with the bylaw of this organization? He said, no, sir, you hadn't. I said, then I don't see any problem with it. And I left there. And ladies and gentlemen, I drove all the way back across the state and I was wounded and I was hurt. And I felt offended. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And the next day, the next week, it wasn't the next day, the next day was Saturday, and then we had Sunday, Monday, of the next week, one of the fellows on the board that lived in northwest Arkansas drove all the way to northeast Arkansas and rang my doorbell. And I opened the door, he says, Brother Pack, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing okay. He said, come out here, I want to talk to you. I walked out on the stomp. Y'all got a stomp around here? I walked out on the stomp, and he, and he put his arm around me. He said, are you okay? 
And I said, I'm okay. And he said, well, what do you think about what happened to you at the board meeting the other day? And I said, well, brother, I'm going to be honest with you. I think you can strain it a gnat and swallow a camel. That's exactly what I think. And he said, Brother Pack, I was so angry. And he said, I was hurt for you. And in the long story short, ladies and gentlemen, that brother nursed me and cared for me and loved on me until I got my bearings back. I was staggering. You hear what I'm saying? I was stumbling uh, beneath that. I was, I was so upset and so hurt. And somebody, my church was growing. It was thriving. People were being saved. People were being added to the church. Young people's growth. I had people baptized in the Holy Ghost in the short time that I was there that had been there for years that had never gotten close to God. God was doing a tremendous work and I was expecting them to get me in that room and just brag on me and lift me up and encourage me. And all of them did. And the only one that didn't, you know who I remember what they said? That one Pharisee. Now somebody said, well, Pastor, how did you get through that? Well, I got through it. And the way I knew I got through it was many, many years later, after we'd been in South Louisiana for a long time, and we moved back to Arkansas and went to camp meeting, and that brother was still there. And it's during one of the camp meeting services, and the Holy Ghost was moving in such a powerful way. And he had been hurting. He had been sick, and he was wounded, and he was just beside himself. And, 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 and people that had known him for years had just kind of left him alone. And the Holy Spirit dealt with my heart, and I walked up to where he's at, and I called his name. And he turned around and looked at me with tears in his eyes and in mine. I embraced him, and I held him, and I said, Brother, I want to tell you, God's got you back on this situation. Everything is going to be all right. Ladies and gentlemen, you see, that's what we have to be able to do. We have to, with the help of the Lord, rise above the traps that the devil sets for us so that we can continue to minister sometimes to the very one that hurts us. I knew at that moment that God had set me free. And I haven't had a moment's trouble since. I didn't live all of those years in South Louisiana worrying about and fretting about him. I honestly didn't. I never even gave it a thought until I came back 10 years, 11 years later and walked into the camp meeting service and there he was and sitting there and he was so crippled and he was so debilitated. He was all slumped over and he was wounded and I could tell that he was hurting and I could tell that he was bewildered and I could tell that things hadn't gone well in his life and oh my God, I had the opportunity by the grace of the Lord to minister life in his heart and in his life. You see, I could have done to him what he done to me. But I don't want that spirit. I don't want that spirit. Any offense usually occurs when you see something, hear something, or experience some kind of a behavior that's so different from what you expected that it causes you to falter and to wobble in your soul and in your faith. In fact, you're so stunned by what you saw or failed uh, or, or by a failed expectation that you lose your footing emotionally. And before you know it, you're dumbfounded about something. Then your shock turns into disbelief and disbelief into disappointment and disappointment into offense. We just get offended by somebody that we had so much confidence in. It's a, it's, a, it's a heavy thing when people put confidence in you. And yet the Bible teaches us that we should be able to have confidence one in another. You that are spiritual, consider the weak and restore such a one to the faith, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. The older ladies are to take and nurture the younger ladies and teach them how to be good wives and how to be good uh, uh, church mothers. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The fathers in the church need to spend time with the young people and young boys and young men so they can learn how they're supposed to treat their wives and children. But it's in those relationships, if we're not careful, we get offended. 
when I got so much confidence in somebody and then I see something or I hear something and I know something, it, 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 it can shake me to the core. We, we all experience this kind of disappointment at some point in our lives. According to the words of Jesus, the opportunity to be offended comes to every one of us. And as long as we live, we're going to combat this problem and we must refuse to allow it to have place in our hearts and minds. How do, how do I deal with that, Pastor? Well, let me just tell you this, and, I, and I'm going to try to wrap all of this together, but let me just tell you this. Do you know if you don't get offended, if you don't take offense, you won't be offended? <laughs> that sounds simple, doesn't it? You say, well, how do I do that, Brother Pack? If I've got confidence in you as my pastor and you do something or you say something that hurts me or something that offends me, then the first thing you need to do is come to me and say, Pastor, I've got a problem. And I promise you I will talk with you and we will pray together about it. You've got to understand my heart is never to be offensive toward you. And so if I say or do something that is offensive, then you've got to recognize that's the work of the devil and he's trying to drive a wedge between us. And then if you refuse to take it, then you're not going to be offended. You understand what I'm saying? Now, there's some things you could somebody come to you and say, ah, oh, Brother Pack, he said this or said that. You could say, yeah, I could, I could see him saying that. But there's some things that somebody might come to you and tell you that I did or that I said that if you know me, you're going to recognize it for what it is, and when you do, you should turn that off. I'll do you one even better than that. You need to look them in the eye and say, you need to shut up about my pastor or my Sunday school teacher or my worship leader or my backup team or my deacons. You ain't got no business talking about my family like that. That's my family. We're not perfect. None of us are perfect, but thank God we're saved. Somebody say amen right there. And we learn how to get along, and we learn how to pray with one another. And we learn how to stand behind one another in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our troubles. And, brother, when we do, we're a long ways down the road to heading off, going into those traps that the devil lays for all of us. <laughs> We've all experienced this kind of stuff in our heart and in our life and so even worse we've all been the source of some offense at some point or another in our lives we the one that done the offending oh I ain't never done that well maybe you don't know you did it but that don't mean you didn't do it all right you, you don't don't get holy on me now just would you be willing to admit that there's a possibility In light of all of this, we need to consider some questions. Number one, have you ever been, have you ever offended somebody? When you found out about how you offended somebody, what did you find, when you found out about the cause of the offense, were you shocked by it? I was. That illustration I gave you a while ago, I had no idea that I'd hurt that man's feelings. I don't even know what we talked about. To this day, I don't know what I said, and I don't know what I'd done. And it's not even important that I did. The only thing that is important is between he and I, I said, please forgive me because I was not trying to be offensive and I know I hurt your feelings and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And when he saw that I was genuine, somebody hear me now. Somebody says, well, no, 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 no. You, it, it doesn't make any difference if you're genuine or not. If you ask for somebody to forgive you, then no, 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 you're wrong. You know Jesus won't even forgive you if you don't ask him with genuine faith. <laughs> one lady told me one time, said, I'll tell you what, I may, my, I may irritate you, but you've got to love me if you're going to heaven. I told her, I said, I love you to get to heaven, but I ain't got to like you. She told me one time in service, she said, I'm going to tell you something. God gave me the gift to tell folks off. That's what she told me. 
the gift to tell folks off. And she exercised it fluently. You hear what I'm saying? No, ladies and gentlemen. See, that's, that's a wrong attitude because if I'm going to be like Jesus, you see, they called them first Christians at the city of Antioch. And the reason they did is because when they looked at those believers, they saw Jesus in their behavior. Huh? They were acting like Jesus acted. <laughs> and so that comes down to the question whenever we live and we move and we have our being one with another in, or in and out of our working relationship, how is it that we deal with one another? And if we got the attitude, well, I don't care if you like it or not, then I promise you, you've been the source of offense to somebody in your life. Because Jesus never lived with that spirit. When the news finally reached you that you had offended somebody, some other person, were you surprised to hear how or, or he or she perceived what you had did or what you had said? I was surprised. I, like I said, I didn't know what I said. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen, no, no, you need to hear this because when I got to him, I didn't have it just a few minutes. He was going to work. I had all the time in the world. I could stand there and talk for an hour. He had to get in there on the machines. But by the time I got to him, I didn't even need to know what I'd said or done. It didn't make any difference what I'd said or done. And I've said this to you before, but I've got to say this again just before I close this message out, and that is this. When we get to the point that we're too big that we can't say I'm sorry to one another, and I can't tell my wife that I'm sorry for hurting her, or she can't tell me that she's sorry for hurting me, or we can't say I'm sorry to our children. We're too big for God to deal with. Are you hearing me? And so God said, I want you to live with this understanding. It's impossible, but that offenses are going to come to you. But you need to be making sure that you do everything in your power not to be the source of the offense. And then be willing, quick to repent and make it right. Through the years, I've learned, and I'm closing, to do the best I can to, be, to avoid being a source of offense to anybody. At the same time, I try not to be too shocked if I find out that somebody somewhere has gotten offended with me. I'm just human. Because people came from different backgrounds and wake up in bad moods and have different situations and bad day at work and don't feel good physically, and they go through a host of other negative experiences in their life, their interpretation of our actions and our word may vary from different situation and different intents from our heart. We've got to understand that. We can be sure that someone during, along the way will misunderstand what we do. You know, Jesus was the most misunderstood man that ever walked on this planet. The very gospel that he came to present became a stumbling block to those that heard it and didn't want to receive it. Again, that's what Peter tells us. Think about that. The very message that can set you free can become a stumbling block if we rather live in the mindset, I'm right and you're wrong and I don't care what you think. We as Christians, therefore, must, number one, do everything in our power to communicate correct messages to one another. And number two, we need to do everything in our power to bring healing and restoration whenever a misunderstanding and offenses happens between us and somebody else. I do not want to be the cause of anybody leaving my presence and missing heaven. I'd rather be wrong. Knowing that I'm right, I'd rather be wrong. I'd rather, I had rather err on the side of grace than I had to err on the side of law. 
because I know God well enough to know that he can straighten it out if I keep Kenneth in check. Would y'all say a good amen to that? I've had a song on my heart for the last several days, and I should have sang it when I got up here tonight. But I want to tell you something. That old song is Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Y'all remember that song? Isn't that true when we deal with a message like we're talking about tonight? Lord, I'm not perfect yet. I'm just a human. I make mistakes all along the way. But God, if you'll help me, if you'll help me, I'm going to get up. If you'll help me, I'll make amends. If you'll help me, I'll make the apologies. I'll do what's necessary. I want to make it to heaven, and I want to go to heaven taking as many folks with me as I can possibly take. I do not want to live the rest of my, day, my days in bitterness and resentment because somebody done or said something to me that hurt me and wounded me, and I refuse to do anything about it. I want to let go and forgive so that God can flow through me the way that he wants to. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you today for the word of God. I thank you for the promises that we live when we stand on. And God, this morning you taught us that we need to trust in those promises. And one of the greatest ones that we need to trust in is whenever we come to the place that we're offended. To understand that you're right there with us and you're never going to leave us nor forsake us. That you understand the pain of being misunderstood even greater than what we do. That you've walked the trail of life a lot longer than what we have. And you can understand us better than we even understand ourselves. And so, Lord, right now I just pray that every heart and every life in this place be touched. Those that are watching by social media, allow the Spirit of the Lord to come upon the scene, God, and set them free by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God, I'm so thankful for the times over the years that people have come to me when we teach and preach along these lines to talk about how that God had set them free from this very same stumbling block that has caused so many of us to falter along the way. In Jesus' name, I plead the blood over every family that's represented by every person that God watches and hears this message right now. And I ask you to make things right before it's everlasting too late. In Jesus' name we pray.